Hi, I'm Joe. This is Ray. I'm Malloy. And I'm Ty. And, and we're, we're Dakota, Dakota Moon. Moon. And I'm Andriani, joined by, as you heard, Dakota Moon, one of the hottest up and coming bands out there. Their music is a blend of pop, rock, and soul, and today they're lending their talents to us to guest anchor the ship. Take it away, guys. One, two. It is Tuesday, January 29th, and you're watching Channel One News. There's been a reminder from Afghanistan that for U.S. troops, the ground war hasn't ended yet. Yesterday, Afghan troops and U.S. Special Forces launched an attack on a hospital where members of Al-Qaeda terrorist organization were holed up. The attack took place in the city of Kandahar, which was one of the last major cities recaptured during the fighting last fall. For seven weeks, six members of Al-Qaeda had barricaded themselves in this hospital, threatening violence if anyone but a doctor came near. Yesterday, just after daybreak, U.S. and Afghan troops decided to end the standoff. The U.S. troops surrounded the hospital and the Afghans charged in. A short firefight ensued. The Al-Qaeda fighters threw hand grenades, wounding five Afghan soldiers. They fought fiercely. We, had to, uh, we didn't. The Afghan forces had to pull back and uh, reorganize and then go back in. It took huge, huge heroism. These American troops guarded the outside of the building while the Afghans went back in. The rest of the hospital stayed open during the attack, and these patients watched the assault from their windows. Eventually, the 10-hour siege ended, and none of the Al-Qaeda fighters survived. Afghan troops had tried to get the Al-Qaeda fighters to surrender, and two weeks ago, food and water were cut off. But it's believed that some hospital workers sympathetic to Al-Qaeda smuggled in supplies. Coming up, we'll continue our look at what happened to Enron and who's to blame. Game 6 in Aspen, sponsored by Mountain Dew, begins February 1st on ESPN. I chose to play the game. It didn't choose me. Sure, things weren't always easy. Friends, fighting, school, drugs. But the game taught me the fundamentals of life. Honesty, teamwork, trust. I knew drugs, even weed, would get in the way. Football my anti-drug. Now I'm the teacher. A new poll indicates the public is skeptical of politicians and their ties with Enron, the bankrupt energy company. The poll comes from CNN, USA Today, and the Gallup organization. The poll found almost half of those surveyed believe that members of the Bush administration and Democrats in Congress have done something either unethical or illegal in their involvement with Enron. How did Enron fall and who's to blame? Seth Doan has part two of his series. Running New York Pizzeria in downtown Houston used to be a gold mine for Arturo Mercado. He was right next to one of the biggest office buildings in town. Unfortunately for Arturo, that building is the headquarters of Enron, where more than half of the employees were laid off last month. We lost between $2,000 and $3,000 a day. It's about 50% 50, 50 on the dining. Um, in the catering business, we lost about 80%. 
Of course, Arturo's loss was just one of thousands when last month Enron became the largest American corporation ever to declare bankruptcy, raising plenty of questions. How can a company like Enron, as big as it is, as successful as it looked, have so many problems? Well, a company like Enron, who starts off as a smaller company, in their case a pipeline company, and then just bought lots of different companies that, that was doing well, made some good choices at the beginning, perhaps they thought they could really do anything and make it successful. And it turns out that that was not the case. By the mid-1990s, it was let's make a deal time at Enron. The company was trading everything from surplus electricity to coal to fertilizer. Enron's stock price kept rising and its employees kept living large. You can uh, tell they were making money because they were eating good, you know, spending money and giving good uh, tips. But Enron had a secret. While it told the public it was making big bucks, it was actually losing money. How did the company get away with that? What Enron did was create a number of partnerships for some of its businesses. Enron was able to take hundreds of millions of dollars of debt off its books and assign it to those partnerships. But that made Enron look like a much more successful company than it really was. What Enron was doing with its partnerships was not a normal business practice. And this Enron executive, Sharon Watkins, wrote a letter to Enron CEO Ken Lay warning that, quote, we will implode in a wave of accounting scandals. But shouldn't someone have been keeping a close eye on Enron? Shouldn't someone have known? Well, every company that's publicly traded has outside accountants looking at its books. And now a lot of people are pointing fingers at the people who looked at Enron's books. Enron paid the accounting firm of Arthur Anderson more than $50 million a year. Experts believe that some of those accountants and a lot of Enron executives must have known the company was in trouble. In fact, later, Arthur Anderson executives would tell accountants to shred Enron documents in what many believe was an attempt to cover up wrongdoing. But Enron's chief executive, Ken Lay, was still urging employees to buy the company's stock, which by last spring had started to fall. If I can remember the quote from, from the emails, we are we're, we're robust and stronger than ever. Uh, Ken Lay's words, he always used words like that. But Ken Lay wasn't buying stock, he was busy selling more than $100 million worth. In fact, 30 of Enron's top executives sold more than $1 billion worth. Many critics believe that Enron executives were aware of Enron's precarious financial situation and wanted to get their money out before the company crumbled. But employees who bought stock through their retirement plan weren't allowed to sell it at all, and many saw their investments shrink to almost nothing. Finally, last October, Enron confessed to the public. It was worth $1.2 billion less than it had been reporting, and the company said not to believe all those earnings reports from the past four years. In other words, Enron was saying, we didn't tell you the truth. Enron was in serious trouble, but employees didn't want to believe it. Enron can't just disappear. It's like IBM disappearing. It's like Procter & Gamble disappearing. You know, it's like Disney crashing. Enron wasn't going to crash. And Ken Lay didn't give up. With the millions he had donated to President Bush and members of Congress from both parties, he thought he could get some help. He called Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill and Commerce Secretary Don Evans. The response, you're on your own. Now, our administration has done the exact right thing. Uh, there have been a, a couple of contacts with people in my cabinet. Uh, and my cabinet uh, officers uh, said no help here. And less than three weeks after those phone calls, Enron declared bankruptcy. 4,000 workers were laid off. An Enron stock, which sold for $80 last February, could now be purchased for less than 80 cents. Congress wants to know why Ken Lay and other senior executives could sell their stock while the employees couldn't, and whether the Bush administration improperly helped the company, and if Enron's accountants tried to cover up Enron's problems by shredding documents. And that's not the end of the questions. It will take months, maybe longer, for all the hows and whys of Enron to be sorted out. For now, many of the former Enron employees and their families are just trying to deal with the what next. Did going to college seem like it would be easier with your mom working at Enron? Yep, because 
they did have so many benefits and she was making a lot more than she had in the longest time so we thought we could start getting things like a new car and fixing our house and everything that we needed. But you found that some of that will have to wait for a bit. Yep. What happens next in the Enron case? Well, Congress is investigating, so is the Justice Department, and it's likely to be some time before those investigations are complete. We'll keep you posted. Up next, a 17-year-old wins a trip to the NBA All-Star Game. We'll have that when we come back. Does using the internet to do your homework ever make you feel lost, stuck, stranded, alone? Is there anybody out there? Yes, at homeworkatabout.com. They have real people to guide you. I'm Matt Rosenberg, and I'm your guide to geography. I need help with my French. Biology. Biology. Shakespeare. Spanish. You didn't come into this world alone. Why do your homework that way? Homework at about.com. Nice. Twitter X Games 6 in Aspen, sponsored by 1-800-CALL-ATT for collect calls, begins February 1st on ESPN. Over a month ago, we gave teens a chance to enter an essay contest through Channel1.com. The winner would get to go to the NBA All-Star Game for a weekend of fun in February. Over a thousand people entered, and 17-year-old Lindsay Mahoney from Northeast High School in Northeast Maryland was the grand prize winner. Lindsay will write an article that will be featured in a future edition of Inside Stuff magazine. Congratulations, Lindsay. Quite a slam dunk. Well, we're out of time, but before we go, Joe, tell us what's in store for the band. Well, our single, Looking for a Place to Land, hit radio just over a month ago. It's already climbing the charts, so we're all really excited about that. Please call your local radio station to request it. And also our CD, A Place to Land, hits stores on Tuesday, February 19th. So please check it out. Very cool and very exciting, too, for you guys. And you guys have a chance to win a signed Dakota Moon CD and poster. Go to channel1.com and click on Games and Contests. That's it for us, guys. Why don't you guys take it away? Looking for a place to land. Looking for a friend to call, looking for a destination, conversation, fascination to protect us from the fall. Please welcome Dakota Moon.
NBA on NBC. Definitely more about the fashion. Dolce head to toe. Roberto Cavalli going on. Eduardo Lucero. The dapper gentlemen and ladies of soul came out decked out Tuesday night. India Aria arrived in a last-minute creation.